A few days ago, as many of you know, many nations just signed an agreement called the Artemis Accords, a treaty essentially dedicated to the peaceful exploration of space. Jim Bridenstine said, quote, Artemis will be the broadest and most diverse international human exploration program in history, and the Artemis Accords are the vehicle that will establish this singular global coalition. We are uniting with with our partners to explore the moon and are establishing vital principles that will create a safe, peaceful, and prosperous future in space for all of humanity to enjoy. However, the reason I'm showing you images of the International Lunar Gateway is because the only countries who sign this agreement are countries who are committed to Artemis in the first place. Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and of course, the United States. But there were two major powers on Earth that did not sign these accords. And these nations, of course, are the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, both of whom have recently expressed an intent to form a union in terms of exploring the moon rather than cooperating with NASA and the European Space Agency. And these are not just idle words. The Chinese, as we all know, have been busily exploring the dark side of the moon with the Chang'e 4 mission along with the U-22 rover. And they have many more ambitious plans in the future, including the manned exploration of the lunar south pole. And the Russians, for their part, have been far from idle, testing a new series of rockets called the Angara family. As a matter of fact, the Angara A5 was tested way back in 2014, and an orbital flight is planned for the 24th of November of this year. Now granted, the Angara cannot lift anything like the SLS can, but nevertheless, it already has the ability to lift more mass than their Proton heavy lift rockets currently, and the long-term plans for the Angara allows the rocket to lift triple the mass of the Proton, giving the Russians the potential of landing fairly substantial payloads on the lunar surface. Now, the Russian end game is to put humans on the surface of the moon by 2030, just six years after the Artemis project is planning to do so, assuming everything goes perfectly right. And the Russians seem to be quite capable of doing this, given how quickly they're developing new rocketry capabilities and the fact that they have now forged an alliance with a country that is also developing heavy lift capability at a very rapid pace and seems quite capable of putting humans on the lunar south pole as well. The lunar south pole is going to start to become a very, very crowded place. And what happens if this Sino-Russian alliance reaches the moon first and decides not to play nice when it comes to the limited resources that the moon has to offer? Well, the answer to this question could be quite terrifying. Welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, October, I've already kind of mentioned that in previous episodes, sort of a spooky time for all of us in many countries anyway, and so sort of a spooky episode. Well, not ghosts and goblins or anything like that, but something that's downright terrifying. The prospect of the Chinese and the Russians going to war in outer space with the rest of the world. 
something that a lot of folks might look upon as being unlikely or far-fetched, that sort of thing. But really, what's happened recently with the Artemis Accords and the fact that both Russia and China refuse to sign is very troubling to me indeed. It suggests that those two countries, especially since they've been talking about working together, are interested in staking their claim, in grabbing property and resources on the lunar surface. And really when it comes down to it, as you're gonna see in the video, there isn't a huge amount available on the moon. Granted, there is a lot, but if we're talking about a lot of countries using lunar resources to fuel and fund their expeditions across the solar system, there's only so much there that's going to be able to support it, as opposed to Mars that has a hell of a lot more water, for example, than the moon does, an, an immense amount of water by comparison. And so the fact that China and Russia refuse to sign those accords indicates to me that they have something else in mind, that they are not willing to put their signatures on a piece of paper that makes a commitment to not grab those resources for themselves. And if that is indeed the case, and the United States in their fickle way of supporting NASA or not supporting NASA, depending on their mood, could decide to cancel Artemis, giving the Chinese and the Russians an opportunity to establish their presence on the moon first, the consequences could be dire indeed. I've talked a little bit about these consequences in the past, but I'm going to go into these things a little bit more in detail this time. Plus, many of you have not seen my older videos about this sort of subject anyway, so I think it would be good to look at it. I'd like to you know, point out exactly what the Russians and the Chinese could do with the strategic advantage of the moon and also just how difficult it would be to dislodge them if they got there first. And let me tell you something, it is a pretty grim prospect and we're going to check that out right now. At first glance, it would seem that the moon has an incredible amount of resources for just about anybody to use. According to this ULA study, we're looking at about 20 billion metric tons worth of water on the moon alone, not to mention what might be in near-Earth asteroids. However, although that sounds like a hell of a lot, it only amounts to 20 cubic kilometers. And although that sounds like a hell of a lot, by way of comparison, more than 21 million cubic kilometers of ice have been detected at or near the surface of Mars by various orbiters. To make matters worse, lunar ice seems to be restricted to areas where the sunlight never strikes, such as the bottom of Shackleton Crater, which is nearly twice the depth of the Grand Canyon, and roughly 22% of the surface of this crater is comprised of ice, but it's 22 kilometers in diameter. That's it, which makes it very valuable real estate. In addition, a colossal amount of metallic resources have been detected beneath the South Pole's surface, probably caused by an impact from a very large metallic asteroid in the Moon's ancient past, making this location even more valuable real estate. It's little wonder then that both the Russians and the Chinese have extremely ambitious plans to colonize the lunar South Pole. There are simply too many resources there to be exploited for the exploration of the solar system and also strategic advantages on the moon to be simply ignored. So how are the Russians going to do this? Well, they have the Angara family of rockets, among others that have yet to be developed, but the Angara is the one that's actually flown. And as you can see, it can have additional boosters added on to it until eventually you get a version that can carry a crew module. The version of the Angara that's supposed to carry people is the Angara 5, although other versions are supposed to also carry the crew module, like some of the new Soyuz, although these have not yet been developed. 
but the actual crew module is called the Aurel, and it carries between four to six crew to the lunar surface, or preferably to an orbiting lunar station. Does that sound familiar? In any event, the maiden robotic launch is supposed to take place in 2023 and the first uncrewed lunar orbit in 2026 with the ultimate objective of making the moon by 2030. Now the Yenisei, also known as the Soyuz 5, which is a super heavy lift rocket that makes the Angara look like a pop bottle rocket, is generally the one that's designed to set up a base on the moon. However, Roscosmos has largely been considered a little too cash-strapped to produce something like this. However, they may not have to build something like this. Instead, they could use the Long March 9, which is planned by the Chinese to come out within the next decade, which is capable of transporting 50 metric tons to translunar injection orbit. That would be more than sufficient to set up an orbiting outpost around the moon and then subsequently a lunar base at the South Pole. So what does controlling lunar resources do for a country? Well, as I mentioned in the last episode, it takes only 10% of the fuel to reach low Earth orbit from the moon than the other way around, that is from the Earth to low Earth orbit. And this is a fact that has not been missed by the US military. They produced a paper on the subject actually, which I have linked in the description. The title is too long for me to repeat here. But essentially what this means is the country that controls the moon has complete freedom of operation in the region between the moon and the earth, whereas those who are operating from the earth are hobbled by earth's incredibly strong gravity. You can operate from the moon far more efficiently and with a lot less fuel and a lot less use of energy than you can if you're restricted by earth's gravitational pull. And it's these facts that led this guy, Brigadier General Boucher, to declare way back in the 1950s that he who controls the moon controls the earth, because you can fire missiles or other projectiles from the moon far more easily than you can retaliate from the earth against the moon. As a matter of fact, it's virtually impossible to retaliate because of the earth's gravity. And this fact, as hard as it is to believe, led the United States to start developing Project Horizon, which was a plan to develop a subsurface base on the moon to launch nuclear missiles against the Soviet Union. And it was pointed out that if a sneak attack were launched by the Soviets, the moon could retaliate within two to three days and there would be nothing the Soviets could do about it. Of course, General Boucher did not not mention the fact that it could also be used for a sneak attack by the United States against the Soviets as well. And as a result, very wisely, a treaty was signed in regards to these things. But this particular plan was not revealed to the public until much later. And it was pointed out way back then that you wouldn't even need rockets to deliver a nuclear punch. You could use an electromagnetic mass driver, and if you positioned this on the dark side of the moon, you could deliver your nuclear strike without the enemy even knowing that it was coming. Now some might call this far-fetched, but in the case of China, we're dealing with a country that's developed a mastery of maglev trains. Are we quite certain that they couldn't develop something like this? And they wouldn't even need to use nuclear weapons. They could use tungsten bolts or just simple small meteoroids driven by this sort of thing to deliver a nuclear-sized strike to the enemy. It's a terrifying scenario that would be almost impossible to defend against. Now, I've mentioned this in previous episodes, but since a lunar mass driver can also be used to launch cargoes into lunar orbit, it does not qualify as a weapon of mass destruction under current treaties. You could build one of these things, making it look like quite a peaceful piece of equipment until you used it against a target on Earth, by that time, of course, it would be too late. 
Now, some would argue that a Space Force lunar starship would be the perfect way to counter such a weapon, to deliver troops to the lunar surface to take out such a device. But there's one thing that hasn't been taken into account with all of these things. The starship cannot go straight to the moon. It has to refuel in order to reach any target, whether it be on the moon or on Mars. And while it's refueling, it would be a sitting duck. The point of refueling is the greatest point of vulnerability for the starship, and even a country like India could easily take out a starship while it was refueling, unless it was bristling with point defense weapons or some other kind of defense against anti-sat weapons. And by the way, if an anti-sat weapon were to take out a combat starship and a tanker simultaneously, can you imagine the cloud of debris that would create around the Earth? It would make any debris created by anti-sat weapon tests in the past a joke in very poor taste. So let's assume that we could get troops there, or let's say both sides got their forces to the Shackleton Crater or wherever our battlefield might be on the moon and were able to deploy weapons. What would that combat be like? Well, believe it or not, the future weapons office way back in the 60s came out with a variety of gas-powered weapons and also spring-loaded dart weapons. And in addition to that, these shotgun-like devices that would also fire these dart-like flechettes they didn't have to be particularly damaging because all they'd have to do is rip through a spacesuit and that would spell the rather catastrophic and painful end for the soldier at the receiving end of the bullet. Now you could send in robots to destroy targets like mass drivers or enemy bases, but remember, robots tend to get hung up on rough terrain and also are vulnerable to hacking, whereas infantry, especially equipped with cloaks that suppress their IR signature, would work out very well in a place like Shackleton Crater, where the light has not touched the surface of the ground for two billion years. But although infantry equipped with plastic explosives or the like might be the best way to take out a position, robots would be the best way to defend it. Utilizing radar and other methods to detect movement, especially since any movement would doubtlessly be the enemy moving in on your position, an artificially intelligent killing machine would be a perfect way to defend a mass driver or whatever else you wanted to defend. These robots might be equipped with weapons like the R-23M, which was a Soviet weapon specifically designed for use in a vacuum, a 23mm cannon with an effective range of almost 2 miles, and was apparently successfully tested on one of the Salyut space stations right before it was decommissioned. A devastating weapon for anybody facing it. And given what I just said about such weapons being hackable, you'd probably want your robots to be a fixed defense rather than something that's mobile. In other words, something that couldn't be turned around and used against you. That would probably be the most useful way to deploy such things, which means it would be living infantry against artificially intelligent defense, which is a terrifying prospect to say the least. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like to be an infantryman operating on a battlefield that had only known darkness for the past two billion years, trying to evade automated defenses with a single directive to kill you, waiting somewhere out there in the darkness, and a single bullet tear through your suit would end your life. I can't think of a war that could be any more terrifying than that. And this is why the Artemis Accords are so damn important, or something like them. This place has to be kept weapon-free. Free of war, free of strife, free of conflict, because the alternative is just too horrible. If the Russians don't like the current agreement, then we have to find another one. Because if we fail to do so,
If the South Pole of the lunar surface becomes our new battlefield, what the Future Weapons Office predicted half a century ago may become prophetic. Quote, we may even now be standing on the edge of the battleground of Armageddon. Unquote. Now, I'd like to make one thing perfectly clear. I don't believe that a Russo-Chinese or Sino-Russian alliance or whatever we call it these days is something that is necessarily going to last. And I'll tell you why. I studied a fair amount of Russian history when I was at university, and my instructor was a man named Alexei Malashev, and he grew up in Stalinist Russia, which is about one of the worst times that anybody could have grown up in Russia, but in any event, in the Soviet Union, of course. But his mother would always send him to bed with stories of the threat from the East. That's what the Russians have traditionally feared throughout their history, has not been the United States, not consistently, but rather this, this mysterious threat from the East, namely China. And the reason for this is something that happened 800 years ago when the Mongol hordes invaded Russia. And at that time, the Russian civilization was focused on the city of Kiev, of all places, Kiev and Russia made the unwise decision to resist the Mongol invasion rather than surrendering and paying tribute. And even though surrendering may seem like, you know, the worst thing that somebody could do with the Mongols, it actually was a very good idea to do that. Because later on, Alexander Nevsky of the city of Novgorod, who's also a very famous figure in Russian history, um, who drove off the Teutonic Knights, he did surrender. And all the, the Mongols asked is just pay tribute and we'll leave you alone. That's what they did to anybody who surrendered, which is one of the reasons why they were so brutal when somebody didn't. In any event, the Kievan Russians, the majority of Russia, did not surrender. They lost decisively in battle, and afterwards, the, the Mongol leaders simply said to the Russian nobles, dinner will be on you tonight. And that phrase had the same connotations back in the 1200s as it has today. Day. So the, the nobles thought ah, that's not that big of a deal, but what actually happened is the Mongols literally had dinner on them. That is, they laid down planks on top of the Russian nobles and had their dinner, all uh, dozens or hundreds of them, and crushed these men to death, um, smothering them in a rather slow and awful way to die. And then the Mongols proceeded to slaughter thousands thousands upon thousands of people in cities all over Kiev and Russia in one of the worst massacres in Russian history, um, kind of unequaled until, uh, until the Nazis invaded in the 1940s. Even Napoleon wasn't that brutal, but the Nazis were. The Russians have an awful history of people invading them um, with awful casualties. One of the reasons why they are so paranoid and so intent on defending themselves but all of that having been said, there is this long-term idea that China represents this huge threat. Now, I know the Mongols and the Chinese are not the same people. They're not the same people at all. The Chinese suffered under the Mongol yoke as much as anybody else did. But the thing of it is, it doesn't matter. For the majority of Russian citizens, they still see this mysterious threat from the East, and that includes China as being this huge threat. And so that's why these alliances, and by the way, the Soviet Union and Communist China were briefly allied as well. And that did not last very long. And this I don't think is going to last very long either because of a huge economic difference between the two countries. The Chinese are enormously powerful economically. The Russians are not. And so it's going to be very clear as to who's going to be calling the shots or at least who's going to think they're calling the shots. And there's no way that Vladimir Putin is going to put up with that. So I have some hope 
that this kind of an alliance is really not going to matter. Added to the fact that I think that the Russians have been very intent on the peaceful exploration of space for quite some time. Their, their Roscosmos is not part of the Russian military the way the Chinese space agency is. So that could be another reason for hope. But still, that doesn't mean that we need to be complacent. We can't just go and and in a fickle nature, cancel Artemis after the next election, assuming there's a change in leadership here. We've got to stay the course and establish ourselves on the moon first, because if the Russians and the Chinese manage to get established there in <laughs> at first, as you've seen in the video, that is not a good thing. It simply is too tempting for them to use that to their advantage. All of that having been said, uh, you you got to see a little bit of my uh, my latest merch that just arrived. Well, I've had this for a little while, but Olympus Mons and the puny mountains and the rest of the solar system and a very scared little rover. And then what's on back, you've seen all of that. But uh, I'll be wearing this pretty consistently. A lot of ways to support my channel through getting merch like this or joining as a Patreon member um, and, all, and just subscribing because I've got this coffee cup still and the coffee may be great that comes out of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to drink it out of here. As a matter of fact, I really don't. Instead, I want to blast this thing to pieces, which means I need to get to 40,000 subscribers. So until the whole world, including Russia and China, are ready to sign on to an agreement that is committed to the peaceful exploration of space and not grabbing resources for themselves, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.